I would now like to expand on this idea that a patient is a point on a reaction norm by taking apart the concept of reaction norms and showing you a bit of what difference they make to our analysis. To begin with, evolution involves a regular alternation between genotypes that contain information and phenotypes that consist of matter. This is an important distinction between information and matter because different sorts of things go on in each of them. A motto from Lee Van Valen is that evolution is the control of development by ecology and I think as I step through this you'll see what Van Valen meant. This picture, which was originally sketched by Dick Lewinton, shows a regular alternation between genotype space and phenotype space. So you should think of this as being uh, the universe in which DNA sequences exist and this as being the universe in which organisms exist down here. Naturally, they are connected to each other and they contain each other in some ways. The first transformation here from G1 to P1, from genotype to phenotype, is development. That's transformation one. And it's at this point that genes interact with environments to map the information in genotypes into the material in phenotypes. That's where reaction norms come in. T2 is ecology and behavior. That's what determines who survives and reproduces. T3 is mating reproduction and some of genetics. That determines the array of gametes that's going to form the next generation. And then T4 is genetics and reproduction. That determines how the array of haploid gametes is transcribed into a set of diploid zygotes. This is going on in every generation. So evolution is operating both in genotype space and in phenotype space, and uh, selection is acting on phenotypes. Development is determining the expression of phenotypes. Development is intimately built in to the apparatus of microevolution at this stage. Now, the result of that kind of developmental transformation is a reaction norm. So here is one possible reaction norm. Here you see temperature, an environmental variable on the x-axis, the value of a trait, size of maturity on the y-axis, and a line relating the two things. So you can say that a reaction norm expresses the phenotype as a function of the environment. Here you see a depiction of a population. It consists of a bundle of reaction norms. Each one of these reaction norms belongs to a particular genotype, and the population consists of a set of genetically heterogeneous individuals, each one of which had the potential to produce this value of the trait, depending on the temperature at which it was raised. And we can calculate a mean reaction norm for the whole population. However, the concept of reaction norm originally is bound to the concept of genotype. A genotype has a reaction norm. Now traits can have markedly different kinds of, of expression. In one of the earlier lectures we pointed out that traits have very different evolutionary ages. They also have very different phenotypic plasticities. Some of them are very insensitive to environmental change. So for example, in organisms like us, the number of digits the number of fingers or toes is very insensitive to the kind of nutrition we have. We all always end up with five. Here the genotypes have just been separated by different colors just to show you that different genotypes are always producing five fingers or toes no matter what nutritional environment they're in. Other traits, for example fecundity, are sensitive to changes in the environment. So G1 in this case is quite sensitive to changes in nutrition. When it's well fed, it has many offspring. When it's poorly fed, it has few. G3 is less sensitive. It has a flatter reaction norm. So that also gets across another concept, and that is that the slope of the reaction norm is a measure of the sensitivity of that trait to changes in the environment. Because of this differential sensitivity, Genetic correlations can actually change sign depending on the environment. And when there's a 
a change in the sign of genetic correlation or covariance across environments, then a developmental mechanism is strongly modulating the expression of genetic variance and covariance. That means that the response to selection is dependent not only on the standing genetic variance and covariance, but it's also dependent upon the way in which it is expressed, and that can change with environment. Now, genetic correlations can produce indirect selection that has surprising effects. In some environments, selection for an increase in one trait might cause a correlated increase in another trait. In other environments, selection for an increase in one trait may cause a correlated decrease in the other trait. In environments intermediate to those described, selection on one trait won't be correlated with any response in the other at all. So, reaction norms are important modulators of selection responses. And that becomes especially important when we're trying to evaluate the effects of trade-offs. Here, for example, is a detailed experiment that was done on Drosophila mercatorum by Martin Gapart. He studied aged eclosion and weighted eclosion. And he raised basically sets of families derived from two females. Now, the nice thing about these females of Drosophila mercatorum is that if you don't give them males to mate with, they will still produce viable offspring and they will do it asexually. So each of the small envelopes down here consists of a group of identical siblings from one mother, and this is from the other mother. So you have six groups of identical siblings from one mother and six groups of identical siblings from another mother raised out across different yeast concentrations, which allows for a precise measurement of reaction norms. Martin observed a positive genetic correlation when the flies were well fed and growing rapidly. That's this 1.5% yeast concentration here and you can see that the slope of this line is steep and positive. And he observed a negative genetic correlation when they were poorly fed and growing slowly, and the slope of this line is negative. So this is a shift in genetic correlation between two traits driven by variation in the nutritional environment. And that is an experimental confirmation of the idea that reaction norms are modulating the expression of genetic, not only of genetic variation, but of genetic covariation in the phenotype. Now, what are the consequences of plasticity for genetic definitions of trade-offs? Well, genetic correlations among traits can change from population to population, within populations over time as gene frequencies change, during the course of development, and from environment to environment. The responses to selection that are then important for life history can also change in all the same ways. This is not just about fruit flies living on yeast in test tubes in the laboratory. This is also about things like the demographic transition and the industrial revolution, which has changed the whole landscape of selection operating on contemporary human beings there are important consequences of plasticity for the human response to selection to these recent important changes in our environments. I love this picture because it is such a dramatic and easily understandable depiction of what a difference human uh, developmental plasticity makes to humans. So Otto and Ewald Spitz are identical twins. They have the same genomes. At the age of 18, Otto began to run distance and Avol began to lift weights. And four years later, at the age of 22, this is what they look like. This is how large a difference can result in the human phenotype due to simple differences in lifestyle, culture, and environment that have nothing to do with genotype. Now, what is the medical significance of phenotypic plasticity? One of the areas in which that significance is particularly striking is the developmental origins of health and disease. This has been a rapidly growing area, which now has its own acronym, DOHAD, that indicates that things that happen early in life have important consequences later in life. Thin infants are at increased risk of cardiovascular disease, diabetes, and obesity in late life. We have learned that exposure to 
Starvation conditions, either in utero or very early after birth, will increase risk of these diseases 50 or 60 years later. Infants that are born by C-section are at increased risk of atopies and obesity. Children who have antibiotic treatments before age two are at greater risk of obesity and allergies. These are effects mediated by microbiota. So these are all reaction norms. These are responses of genotypes to variation in the environment. Phenotypic plasticity can be of several types. It can be reversible, so if body weight and muscle mass are reversible. Otto and Avald Spitz probably could have reversed the way they appear by switching uh, regimes. It can be irreversible. Body height does not change after maturation in humans very much. It can be confined to specific developmental stages. So for example, the whole DOHAD paradigm tells us that things that happen early in life, in particular probably in, uh, in utero and in childhood, are critical and can have knock-on consequences throughout life. Some of them can be produced at any stage. So tanning and acclimation to altitude can be produced at any stage of development. Some of them are continuous, like agent maturation, and others are discontinuous. So for example, you can have morphs in water fleas, casts in insects, where they're morphologically quite distinct things that are being produced by the same genotype. And in summary, the expression and development of many traits are sensitive to the environment. The concept of a reaction norm is useful when analyzing how genes and environments interact to produce phenotypes. Reaction norms are properties of genotypes, and in humans, they are most clearly visualized as the differences that develop between identical twins reared in different environments or undergoing different exercise regimes. Many medical conditions in adults are sensitive to environments encountered early in life. That's the Dohad paradigm. 